Well, good morning, Cross Culture City. It's, it's so good to be uh, with you guys this morning. Um, I bring uh, greetings from your brothers and sisters in Tanit. Uh, if this works, yes. So God has been so faithful to us. Uh, we planted the church in April last year with 30 adults and close to 20 children. And we now have steady attendance of about high 80s, even during the Christmas break and school holidays. We praise God for that. And recently we did our Christmas carols in the park and it was quite well attended by the community as well. Uh, we told the true story of Christmas through narration, through songs, uh, through children's skits as well. So we always hope to bless the community by organizing something lively, something fun during the holiday season. And at the same time, we wanted the local residents to, uh, to know what Christmas is all about, especially many of them come from uh, predominantly from other religions. So I would like to thank you for partnering with us. Uh, thank you for financially partnering with us as well as prayerfully supporting us. Please continue to uphold us in your prayer so we will see many people coming to the knowledge of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Well, now we are on the third part of how to find success in 2024 series. And, and if you want to talk about success, if you want to talk about finding success in 2024, we have to talk about money. And my screen suddenly go blank. Just give me a second. Talk about money straight away. My screen refused to. All right, cool. All right. And uh, because like it or not, like it or not, we will, we closely associate success with, with money for both the right and the wrong reasons. That's why I think we must talk about money. But of course, the question is, when we talk about financially successful, what is financial success? How do we know if we have succeeded financially? I still remember back when I did my research degree, this is back in 2004, uh, one of my ambitions was actually to be an academic and probably work my way up to become a professor or something. The salary, the perks are quite tempting. However, interestingly, interestingly, many professors that I knew of were either estranged for the, from their family, uh, divorced, or leading quite a lonely life. Now, I'm sure there are many professors out there who have meaningful and fulfilling lives. But at least this got me thinking about what I must sacrifice to pursue that kind of life. Is that really a successful life that I'm looking for? You might know this guy, John Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, the founder of the Standard Oil Company, the first US billionaire, and once the richest man on earth, he was asked by a reporter, Sir, how much money is enough? And he calmly replied, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And that's a billionaire we're talking about. You know, he, he was probably kidding a little bit, I think. But we can relate, can we? Just a little bit more and I can afford that electric vehicle. Just a little bit more and I can afford that house. Just a little bit more and I can upgrade my camping tent to a better one. Just a little bit more, I can, you know. You see, if we listen to the world's wisdom, I think we will be confused. And we will always feel insufficient. And, and consequently, we will always chase after money, even at the expense of other more important things in life. I, th I think that's why the Bible talks a lot about money. Not because Jesus needs your money, no. If anything, all that we have is from Him anyway. The Bible talks a lot about money because God knows money has a way to grip your heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. And that's why today's passage is, is very important. Now you notice that I'm preaching from the same passage Pastor Takeshi preached on the first Sunday. Uh, but there are two big differences. Firstly, I think I will focus a lot more about financial success, not just success in general. And I think this passage will be very appropriate if we want to talk about money because Jesus talks about money here. And secondly, I will not preach in Japanese, all right? <laughs> and I will not sing. Sorry, I hope you're not disappointed, okay? Um, 
Anyway, if you look at the passage today, you know, when, when you read the passage, you always I have to ask the question, what is the point of this passage? What is the point of this parable? What is the point of this story? And Jesus' point is clear. We don't have to, we don't have to guess what Jesus is trying to say. He says very clearly, Take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That is his point. Your life must not be defined by how much money you have or how much stuff you own. But then Jesus elaborates for us three things when it comes to money. Three things. So that's what we are going to unpack today. The worldly wealth, the foolishness of worldly wealth, and the true riches. So let's unpack this together. So firstly, the worldly wealth. Now the parable is Ooh, okay. The parable is Jesus' perfect illustration of how people typically approaches, uh, approach wealth. Uh, obviously, this man is doing well financially. Uh, his land produces plentifully. And the main thing he thinks about is this, how can I make sure this is all sure that this is all for me? The thought of how can I share this? Whom can I bless with all this abundance? Those kind of thoughts don't come to his mind. It's all about I, I, me, my. Now, of course, when you read this, some of us, many of us might say, ah, good thing I'm not the same as this man. Good thing I'm different from this man. I'm not that rich. Well, think again. Uh, David Platt, a pastor and theologian, he writes this. We may not always feel rich, that is likely because whenever we hear the word rich, we immediately think of the kind of people who have far more than we do, and consequently, we rarely perceive ourselves as rich. But we need a new perspective, for if we have clean water, I think we all have, sufficient food and clothes, we never ask the question, all our questions is always, I said to my family, our questions are always, what do we eat tonight? Not, are we going to eat tonight? at night, access to medicine, a mode of transportation, even if it's public, and ability to read a book, then relative to billions of people in the world, we are incredibly wealthy. Now, if you're not sure, you can go to this website called givingwhatwecan.org to find out how, how rich you really are. If you are a family of four and one parent has a stable job in Australia, your family is among the top 15%, the the top 15% richest people in the world. And if both parents work, your family is among the top 10% in the world. Now, some of you might say, but I'm a uni student. What about me? Well, sorry, you guys are broke. No, I'm joking. (laughs) Uh, No, no, actually, actually, if you receive a monthly allowance of just 2,000 from your parents, just 2,500, I don't think any of us receive that amount of money. I think we all receive more than that. And that 2,500 will pay towards rent and everything else. Now, rent is already, what, 2,000 a month, I think? Or, I don't know. If you receive a monthly allowance of 2,500 from your parents to pay towards rent and everything else, you are in the top 10% in the world. So no, don't think that you're broke, okay? (laughs) Now, of course, I'm aware, I'm aware that some of us here are perhaps struggling financially, so I don't want to belittle your hardship. But for most of us, for most of us, we are quite comfortable, are we? We are quite comfortable. Okay, you might say, okay, maybe I'm not as poor as I think I am, all right, but thank God I'm not as selfish as this man. Well, I'm sure you're not selfish, but let's reflect a little bit. You see, the man's ambition is this. I want to make sure that I have enough so I can relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And that's the typical definition of financial freedom, financial independence, right? According to Wikipedia, financial independence is a state where an individual or household has accumulated sufficient financial resources to cover its living expenses 
without having to depend on active employment or work to earn money in order to maintain its current lifestyle. Hands up if you don't want this. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> Hands up, I mean, tell me if this is not in your mind at all, right? A state where we can just relax, eat, drink, and be merry. According to the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia, the amount of savings required to achieve a comfortable requirement at the age of 67 is 690,000 for couples and 595,000 for singles. And those figures are in today's dollars. If you retire in 20 years, give or take, with the inflation rate, I think this will be close to $1 million. And that's on top of your paid off mortgage. But who wants comfortable life at the age of 67? We want comfortable life now, right? If we can retire right now, we will retire right now. And a study published in June 2022 by a university in UK, it finds that for most people, the amount of money they need to lead an absolutely ideal life is, can anyone guess? For those in poorer countries, they say $1 million, in, $1 million is ideal. In America, many people say they need at least $100 million. A small minority says billions of dollars, and some says unlimited wealth. <laughs> However, for most people, the study finds the answer is $10 million. $10 million. That's how much money is needed to lead an absolutely ideal life. That means majority of us here are not leading an ideal life. <laughs> right? But look, but I must admit though, I must admit, I find myself thinking from time to time, you know, with 4% savings interest, if I have $5 million, it will give me an interest of $200,000 per year. That's plenty. I think that's comfortable, right? Okay, let's not talk about $5 million. Just give me $3 million, $120,000 per year. I think I can retire. Again, has anyone ever thought like that, even for a bit? Or is it just me? <laughs> you see, if we are honest, I think we are not that different from this man. We are not that different from this man. You see, after all, if we are not careful, we will want to have what this man has. We will not be different from this man. And, and you know what, do, what God says to, about this? What does God say about this? He says, fool. God says, fool. God doesn't pull his punches. He doesn't say, you're not that clever. You are, you know, you are mistaken. No, he says, fool, stupid, idiot. God has a word for the people who, approaches, who approach money like the man in the parable. Now, of course, we have to ask, is, is Jesus saying that everyone who desires to earn more money is a fool? Is it foolish to work hard to live a more comfortable life? Is it sinful to be rich? Of course, the answer is no. The Bible is clear. The Bible condemns laziness. The Bible encourages us to work hard to earn our own living. So, therefore, what aspects of this man's life that are considered foolish? Well, there are two aspects at least. Two aspects at least from this parable. Firstly, this man is a fool because he puts his trust in his money. He bangs all his life on his money. He thinks his money is his savior. With the money that we have, with more money, I will be more in control of my life and nothing can bring me down. In short, he is resting on his own possessions. He's resting on his own possession. This man accumulates wealth so that he can rest. He can relax. He can eat, drink, and be merry. But of course, the question is, can we really rest on our, in our possessions? Can we really rest on our possessions? Because you and I know that money cannot save us from worries. Money cannot save us from conflicts and many other things that cause us stress. If anything, money might actually make us more worried. Money cannot guarantee your future. 
You know, when, when my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer back in 2017, I flew back to Indonesia quickly to visit him. He was happy to see me. But then he said this to me. Among the first things that he said to me, he said this. I had so many plans for my family. Man, I had so many plans for this family. And cancer just robs him of all his plans. You see, our life is not in our hands. Our life is not in our hands. We're all subject to our mortality. Our wealth cannot even protect us from aging, let alone death. Yes, money can help us, but it cannot save us. Money is a good servant, but it is a terrible savior. So you are a fool if you put your faith in your possessions. And secondly, this man is a fool because he is investing in his own earthly estate. He is investing only in his own earthly estate. He is accumulating wealth, thinking that it will be with him forever. Unfortunately, none of us brings our wealth to our death, right? The pharaohs, for example, he built, they built the pyramids as their final resting place with all the treasures in it. But those treasures are not enjoyed by the pharaohs in the afterlife. Those treasures are en were enjoyed by those who broke in and looted the pyramids. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of this world. And furthermore, this man does not have God in his mind at all. God, he doesn't have God in his equation at all. All he thinks about is himself and his estate. And Paul and then Paul has, a, has, has something to say about this kind of man. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks to him. But they become futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts, again the word foolish there, foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. When we exchange the glory of God for the things of this world, when we put our trust in the things of this world instead of God, we are foolish we are foolish now again it is not sinful to work hard it is not sinful to earn your own living it is not sinful to to be rich no but it is foolishness if one lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards god it is foolishness to rest on one's own possessions and investing only in one's earthly estate so, what should we do then? Well, Jesus says here, true riches, true financial success is when someone is rich towards God. Is rich towards God. Now, what does it look like? Again, Jesus illustrates two aspects of it in the passage. In verses 24 to 31, he explains to his disciples, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them of how much value you are than these birds. Verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. You see, so the first thing that Jesus says is that if you want to be truly rich towards God, true riches is this. Instead of resting in your own possessions, instead of resting on your own possessions, you are truly rich when you are resting on God's provision. Now, why do people accumulate money? Anyway, why do people accumulate money? Because they want to live a worryless life, right? The real aim is not the money. The real aim is peace and rest. And unfortunately, money cannot ultimately give you that. Only God can give you that. The most peaceful person is not someone with an abundance of wealth, no. The most, the most peaceful person is, is someone who knows that God is with them no matter their circumstance. You are truly rich when you can rest today knowing that, how, that God has got your tomorrow. And secondly, in verses 31 to 33, Jesus says this, Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is 
the father's for you, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom sell your possessions and give to the needy provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys so instead of investing in our own earthly estate that you will not bring with you after you die anyway invest in god's kingdom invest in god's kingdom you give to God, give to the church, give to the poor, support the missionary, consider supporting Caitlin just now, who is going to be a full-time missioner, uh, doing mission in RMIT. Give to the poor, share your resources with those in need. You know, at the end of every year, Maria and I budget for, for the following year, and we always follow this simple principle, give, save, spend give save spend we decide first how much of our income we will give we will channel towards giving we give towards church we give towards mission we give towards the children that we sponsor through compassion and then we set aside some margin as well so that we can respond to any need that arise throughout the year so friends if you call cross culture your home church i encourage you to give regularly to the church it is an expression of your worship the money will go towards furthering furthering this the gospel in the city and also furthering the gospel around the world give towards the church now of course the question is how much should we give to god well for us as a family we decide a, a certain percentage of our income will go towards investing in god's kingdom and how many percent well the new testament does not prescribe a certain percentage the new testament encourages to give cheerfully and sacrificially cheerfully means that you have to be happy about it and sacrificially means that it has to affect your lifestyle it has to affect your lifestyle maybe after you give you cannot have that many bubble teas in the week anymore you know maybe you have to cut down on your coffee maybe instead of eating out twice a week you have to eat out only once a week maybe you have to there sacrificial means it has to affect your lifestyle you have to forgo certain things in order to give certain amounts to God based on the Old Testament we personally think that 10% is a good start 10% is a good start and then we gradually increase over the years now some of you can give more than 30% and it still hasn't affected your lifestyle at all I know but some of you on the other hand are going through tough rough patch and you can only give 3% that's fine we are not here to compare. We are here to give cheerfully and sacrificially. And, and if you are a uni student, I encourage you to, to start now. You know, calculate how much, you, you know, you, some of you might say that, but that's my parents' money. Well, you spend it, so it's yours. Calculate how much, <laughs> calculate how much money you spend each month, including your rent, and then adjust your lifestyle the following month so that you can live with 90% of it and then start giving 10% to the church. Don't go and ask your parents, can I have 10% more? No, <laughs> that does, that's not how it works, okay? Live with just 90% of how you usually live and start giving 10%. And trust me, you start this habit early and it will be with you as you grow older. If you cannot give now, if you cannot spare $100, $200 a month now, what makes you think you can spare $500, $600, $700 later when you start working? No, the habit is very important. It's an expression of your worship to God. Be rich towards God. And then after giving, we work on our savings, we work on our spending. There's nothing wrong with saving money for the future. God wants us to, to be a good steward of our money. There's nothing wrong with spending and enjoying the fruit of our labor. God wants us to enjoy His good gifts. But make sure that investing in God's kingdom is your first priority. When you sort that out, when you sort out the gift first, you can save comfortably, confidently, and you can spend without feeling guilty. Give, save, and spend. So now, going back to our topic, how to be financially successful friends you must choose therefore you must choose will you rest 
on your own possessions and invest in your own earthly estate. If you do that, chances are you will not be free from money, uh, be free from worry, you will not have peace, and you might actually be enslaved by your money. You will never feel truly rich. You will always feel inadequate. Or you can choose to rest on God's provision and invest in God's kingdom. We acknowledge that our money is God's loan to us. We are simply the managers. We are not the true owners. And if we do that, we will not be enslaved by our money. We will have peace and we will feel truly blessed. So this is still January, still the early, early part of the year. So I encourage you to reflect on your financial plan this year. How are you going to use your money? Because the way you use your money is a reflection of your relationship with God. You cannot say it to your spouse, you cannot say it to your children, you cannot say to your good friends, I love you, I care for you, but you never spend on them. And God, and, and the, the, therefore the way you use your money is a reflection of your relationship with God. God wants you to have a truly blessed and peaceful life. That's what He wants. God doesn't need your money. He wants your hearts. He wants your hearts. Where your treasure is, there will all your heart be also. As you give towards God, as you channel your money towards God, don't be surprised that what is in your mind more and more is God's kingdom, God's business. So friends, is your heart focusing only on, this, on the things on this earth? Or are you fixing your minds and hearts on things above? True riches are when you invest in something eternal. It is secure, it gives you a solid return on your investment. And if you're not a Christian now, if some of you here are not Christian, friends, the key to financial peace, the key to financial peace is having peace with God. It's having peace with God. The, the key to financial success is having a living relationship with God. When you trust Him, when you know that He loves you, when you are assured that He is good for you, then your approach towards money will change and you will have peace with God. You will have peace with yourself and you will have peace with your money. You can enjoy your money. Everything just falls in the right places. So if you don't have a right relationship with God, perhaps today is the day that you, will, that you want to start. Speak to me, speak to someone after the service. We'll love to help you start your relationship with God today. Let me close in prayer and let me take questions. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this um, amazing parable that, that Jesus told us in the Bible. And we thank you, Lord, that it is recorded for our benefit as well, that it has so, much less, so many lessons for us. We pray that this will not just be a good information for us, but we will obey, we will adjust our life, we will align our hearts with your hearts so that we will experience that what it means to be truly rich towards you and we can really experience your power, your goodness, your peace in our lives. And we pray for those who are, not, uh, who are far from you, who don't have a relationship with you yet. Father, we pray that you will draw them to yourself. Show them that you are a good God. You care for them. You care for them spiritually, emotionally, and you care for them materially as well. We pray, Father, that all of us will fix our minds towards you, will seek your kingdom first, trusting that you will add everything else unto our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.